Um, the talk is called The Gradual Realization that Astronomical Information is Bounded uh, over the range of 1965 to essentially today. Um, Multi-messenger astronomy, the introduction of neutrino, gravitational wave, and high-energy cosmic ray detections, plus an ever-expanding capability of capturing and analyzing electromagnetic waves reaching us from across the universe, has introduced a new level of enthusiasm in astrophysics, suggesting that observations made by means of one type of messenger may henceforth be verified through observations by totally unrelated means. In this talk, I'll present the history of this particular discussion, which had its foundation in two apparently unrelated thrusts of the mid-1960s. The first originated in two papers by Sir Resdahl, published on gravitational lensing in 1964. The second appearing a year later was the discovery of the microwave background radiations by Penzias and Wilson in 1965. Within months of his discovery, Robert Gould and Gerald Schroeder in San Diego realized and predicted that no gamma rays with energies above 10 to the 13th electron volts would ever be observed from galaxies more remote than uh, 10 to the um, uh, more remote than 100 megaparsecs. Even if nature were ever able to produce gamma rays at such high energies, their collisions with microwave background photons on passage through the intergalactic medium would quickly produce electron-positron pairs that would soon dissipate their energies. Some months later, similar predictions by Ken Grison at Cornell and independently by George Zatsepin and Vadim Kuzmin in the Soviet Union specified that a similar upper energy limit would have to exist for cosmic ray particles at energies around 10 to the 22nd power EV, again, due to collisions with microwave background photons. At the time, neither gammas nor cosmic ray particles had ever been observed at energies, even factors of millions lower than such extremes. Half a century later, however, new observatories are in place and um, the um, predicted extremes have actually been found. Here we see that no cosmic rays at energies above 2 times 10 to the 20th electron volt on the extreme right are ever observed. Please note that the vertical scale on this plot uh, has been some multiplied by particle energy e to the 2.6 power to visually flatten this figure out. Otherwise, we would see that particle abundances at the highest energies at right are staggering factor of 10 to the 22 lower than uh, those uh, and low energies on the left. So you have this precipitous decline. Um, nor have extra galactic gammas at energies higher than 10 to the 13th electron volts been observed, though we are confident that they are produced in other galaxies that di differ a little from ours. In the Milky Way, the very highest energy gamma rays shown here in these several regions towards the galactic center, but not right at the galactic center, are shown and uh, their energies top out at around 10 to the 14th electron volts. Corresponding abundances of electrons and positrons shown in this slide um, show sharp upper bounds at considerably lower energies, less than 10 to the 14th GeV or 10 to the 13th electron volts. Again, the precipitous billion-fold decline in particle densities at high energies is flattened out in this figure um, because of a multiplicative factor of e to the third power here. A decade more, 
earlier, a, a decade earlier or more, radio astronomers had found also that the galaxy's interstellar plasma blocked the transmission of radio waves with energies at or below about 10 to the minus 10 electron volts from ever reaching us. So at least for photons, there appeared to be both an upper limit and a lower energy bound, uh, limiting the ability of photons from reaching us from across the universe. In the mid 1970s, I started wondering whether any other bounds on photons able to reach us might exist, particularly for long journals across the universe. Were there limits to the quality achievable celestial maps or to timing precision or to spectral resolution we might require to learn as much as possible about the universe due to such effects. At the time I compiled some charts on this in my book Cosmic Discovery, which was published in 1981, 40 years ago. Some bounds at that time did appear to exist, but nothing jumped out as likely to soon hinder further progress. This is a slide that came out of the book Cosmic Discovery. I've now updated three of the resolving power figures I'd included there. They are somewhat complex, so um, I should spend a little time explaining them. But to anticipate the overall conclusions, I should say right away that the prospects today, 40 years later, <coughs> now look rather different as explained in greater depth in my more recent book, Cosmic Messengers, The Limits of Astronomy in an Unruly Universe, which unfortunately due to delays through the coronavirus epidemic is only now slated to be issued in Europe and the UK next Thursday, February 11, and in the US sometime in March. <coughs> but anyway, the books are printed, they just haven't been distributed. Common feature to all three plots that I'm going to be showing here are a horizontal scale at the bottom. <coughs> at the extreme left, as shown, we deal with gamma rays and then progressing to the right, X rays, ultraviolet, viol visible infrared microwaves and radio waves at the extreme right. The vertical scale at left um, is shown in powers of 10 on a logarithmic scale also. The number minus 10 over here um, corresponds to one billion, one ten billionth of a radian, about 20 micro arc seconds. The small rectangles, the small <coughs> rectangles at upper left shown here in successively lighter shades of green identify different epochs in the development of ever more powerful tools. The darkest green region shown at the center of the main jagged figure tells us the angular resolving powers available to astronomers around the year 1919. It involved mainly visible light with some heat sensing near infrared capabilities. A slightly lighter shade to the right here of that very dark one um, is somewhat broader and covers uh, capabilities encountered in 1939. Note also the small square in the same dark shade at lower right indicating the onset of radio observations by Carl Jansky in the mid-1930s. Progressively lighter shades of green show how by today we're able to resolve an angle of one ten billionth of a radian at least in one or uh, around here, or possibly a second place in the microwave region. Um, this, this single plot then provides us with a record of the history over the past century of progressively improving capabilities to image and map the heavens across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Progress has been mind boggling. The highest angular resolving powers recorded to date, roughly 10 micro arc seconds, has been obtained at two micrometers in the near infrared um, by Reinhard Gensel's interferometer named gravity. That's this peak right here. Um, 
the um, peak capabilities in the microwave regions are provided by the event horizon interferometer with an angular resolving power of 25 uh, micro arc seconds um, at wavelength of 1.3 millimeters. This instrument recently brought us images of the shadow of the central massive, supermassive black hole in the galaxy M87. Hypothetical systematic disturbances of the trajectories of photons arriving at the observer are shown by the wavy lines horizontally stretching uh, from right to left. Um, where that line is actually located, an upper limit of what could be usefully done in instrumentation, I'll discuss in a minute. This slide uh, is essentially the same plot I've just shown you before, uh, but shows the angular resolving power and wavelength range um, at which different discoveries were made. The discovery of X-ray stars in 1962 indicated by the two little yellow stars at lower left, the microwave background radiation um, in 1965 is marked by the red, red square here. Um, the microwave fluctuations in 2011 marked by the location here of the yellow square. These symbols are located to show the combination of wavelengths, available angular resolving power, and historic epoch time uh, at which the instruments uh, that were available enabled the discoveries that, that uh, I've, I've indicated by those symbols. A similar plot progressively advancing spec of spectroscopic capabilities is shown on this slide. The highest spectral resolving powers shown here are about 10 to the 8th, allowing us to detect velocity differences of the order of 3 meters per second along the line of sight to a source. Intense efforts by planetary scientists have recently improved this by another factor of a few. Improvements are also on the way for higher resolution radio observations of pulsars to detect the distribution of faint gravitational waves in space um, that cause the motion of the pulsars. The technologies for that, however, may already exist, uh, largely at least. And finally, uh, the time resolution that's available at different epochs. Um, sh this slide shows the instrumental capabilities required to measure both progressively slower evolution towards the top of the plot and extremely brief bursts towards the bottom. The upper limit shown is for time spans now by now covered by the history of astronomical observations, a few thousand years. The dashed line at bottom is determined by available instrumental bandwidths. In the centimeter range, we already have reached um, very close to this uh, limiting line. Uh, which is roughly corresponds to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that's encountered there on, on this dashed line. Bounds on the energy and spatial spectral or timing resolution, however, are not the sole bounds to consider. At times, any of the messengers arriving at, at Earth and at our observatories unscathed at other times, some of them will arrive irrevocably transformed. Physical processes by now well understood determine which messengers can be trusted to reach us intact and which cannot. Gravitational waves, neutrinos, and cosmic rays discussed in considerable depth in my book all have their own limitations, some of which differ considerably from those of photons. By now we know of many factors that affect whether a given messenger can be trusted or not. Astronomers traditionally have taken such factors into account through multi-messenger observations. We use those messengers we trust most to infer times and directions of arrival and spectral frequencies we would have observed had the medium through which all these messengers passed been ideally transparent. This policy, however, breaks down when gravitational deflection 
and time delay begins to affect observations, usually as we reach relatively high angular and timing resolution. This breakdown occurs because, as general relativity teaches us, gravity deflects all messengers identically. At highest energy resolving powers, we can no longer count on any given set of messengers to provide independent cross checks on the veracity of information yielded by others. This is because gravity channels any and all messengers to follow identical paths. This is a really very important uh, consideration. Computations by Chris Kohanek and SS Tai at Ohio State University of angular deflections of radiation from a gravitationally lensed quasar, radiation that first passes through the plane of a galaxy acting as a randomly diffracting gravitational grating for light, shows a complex pattern on the left here on scales far more extended then the lensed image of the quasar itself, this little green circle here on the upper left. Observations of the positions of remote sources with our galaxy's plane are sim within our ga galaxy's plane are similarly affected by random displacement of remote sources in the galactic plane on scales of order 50 micro arc seconds or um, over time the noise through the displacements will undulate as the lensing stars between us and the distant sources uh, move around. Corresponding small-scale gravitationally induced noise in time delays of radiation passing through this grid of stars stretching several kiloparsecs along the plane of the galaxy should also appear. Cumulatively mean gravitational time delays of arrival of photons and could be of the order of 50 milliseconds and the random noise in that delay of the order of 500 microseconds, gradually undulating, undulating as the stars randomly move around. Gravitationally induced noise is by now found to be ubiquitous through Planck observations of the cosmic microwave background, systematic distortions of the shapes of galaxies at high redshifts, gravitational lensing of remote supernovae by massive foreground galaxies, and mutual lensing of stars in galactic studies. Such gravitation effects herald, herald a future in which further instrumental improvements will no longer yield appreciable improvement in data. The precise level at which further instrumental resolving power will no longer help will depend in part on whether intended observations are extragalactic, galactic, or involve nearby exoplanetary systems. All these can be roughly estimated even today and will be more readily calculated once we better understand the nature and distribution of dark energy and dark matter, both in galactic and extragalactic domains. Because of the finite bounds on required instrumental resolving powers just mentioned, a finite range of instruments should ultimately suffice to teach us all we will ever be able to learn through remote observations of the cosmos. Even though instruments with high spatial, spectral, or temporal resolving powers could then in principle be constructed, they might serve few astrophysical purposes if the information the messengers transmit were no longer trusted at such high levels of precision. A finite set of observational tools could then suffice to take us as far as conceivable ins instrumentation ever will. We may then reach the realization that major cosmic phenomena could exist that simply do not generate messengers able to reach us unscathed and intact, and therefore might never be directly observed. To learn more at that stage, we might need to resort to extended cosmic voyages across space and time, which however might be unaffordably expensive. This is my talk and if you want to know more, um, it's in this book, as far as I can, uh, could get in this, uh, in looking at this problem. Thank you very much. It was a very fascinating talk and we really look forward to the book. 
There is one question by Christian Spearing, so please. Yeah, uh, thank you for this very interesting talk. I did not expect that you update your Cosmic Discovery book um, uh, just now, and of course I will buy it as soon as possible. Uh, one question. Well, the, the, the one that was uh, recover, uh, recovered last summer is essentially an identical copy of what was done in 1981. Um, yeah, uh, it was that I have. Yeah. No, my question is the following. In this book from 81, uh, you made mm -hmm. a prediction about the uh, number of new phenomena uh, which mm -hmm. discovered per decade or something. Yes. Have you, uh, can one update that? Uh, or I have updated it. It's in this new book also. Let me see if I can get down to where that. And, okay, this is the new list of discoveries on the left. Uh, you go upward from the earliest discoveries of stars and planets up to the cosmic microwave background radiation. On the right, uh, you go from 31 infrared stars up to number 60, stellar black hole mergers of gravitational waves. And if you want to see the historic development of that, oh, yeah. on this plot here from one to 60, um, you can see the accumulation of discoveries um, up on the upper curve. And the lower curve here shows the uh, mean value um, centered on a 25 year interval of the mm -hmm. number of discoveries per year. So you can see that um, I had very fruitful years in 1970 and 19, and in the range from 19, about 70, about 19, till to about 1990, and it's slowing down now. Uh, yeah. As you can sort of see by this, the, the, the uh, slightly changed slope. And the total number that I estimate now is about 91 on the same arguments as before. That's a little bit less than 120 that I had figured then, but we have more information now on the individual um, on the phenomena and can come up with better estimates. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, are there other questions? It can be raised. I mean, this is a talk which is must to do with the topic of the workshop. Uh, and I'm wondering whether there are questions by the other speakers. If not, I should say, I should mention one thing just very briefly because um, just because observational astronomy may come to an end doesn't mean that all other scientific disciplines will uh, face the same fate. Physicists already are inventing, constructing, and studying new universes every day, many of them evolving uh, at temperatures of a billionth of a degree Kelvin, never encountered in the real universe, in nature. Geneticists similarly are daily inventing new biological species by assembling novel genetic codes never encountered in nature. In astronomy, we don't have that luxury. We lack the means for significantly altering the universe we inhabit. So observational astronomers will run into a final barrier that will hardly cause other scientists to even stumble. I'm not, I'm not saying that science will come to an end in any of what I've said here, just that observational means uh, will not be available to us in astronomy, and we don't unfortunately have the luxury of changing the universe around us. Or maybe knowing the nature of human uh, beings, it's just as well that we don't. Thank you very much. This is fantastic. <laughs> Christian, do you want to go? Just in this spirit, I just want to say one example. I mean, if we would have now or in 10 years, a new supernova and it detects the same neutrinos as from supernova uh, 87, only in a, a higher quantity, we could learn much more because we know so much more about neutrinos. So uh, we, we learn more. Um, this oh, yeah. No, that's true. You now, but but the tools which we have in interpretation are so much improved that we make progress in science anyway. 
Yeah, no, that's uh, uh, it's true. But after a while, if you are not able to make novel observations, um, you run into this limit uh, where the gravitational uncertainties imposed by passage um, past other sources, um, slowing down um, a beam, giving a spread in neutrino arrival times, for example, whatever. Um, after a while, you face diminishing returns. And I think young people wanting to do something exciting will just say, oh, we've seen all this. Um, we'll go into a different field. So you're quite pessimistic about the future of uh, astronomical observation research? Um, no, I, I think it'll take, well, not my future anyway. Uh, I, I figure at, at the current investments worldwide, uh, we will have all the instrumentation um, that will help us to make new discoveries um, within at most something like a century or two. And after that, um, it'll be sort of like geography. You know, it didn't take very long uh, after we had uh, circumnavigated the Earth to figure that we couldn't find another mountain that was higher than Mount Everest. So that that was sort of the end of geography in a sense, unless you count uh, going into the Earth's interior, which is of course very exciting, but also will eventually uh, reach limits. Thank you very much. This is a very important point on the limits of science, which is, of course, um, a tricky uh, point also for historians uh, when uh, science is in the is in the a particular science is in the limits of what can be done in a particular period. Uh, okay, I mean there is a question. It's quite late, but if you have a short, what about dark matter? Couldn't it bring a completely new horizon for astrophysics? By a... yes, um, it it could. I suspect it's fairly limited. Um, the phenomena that I've listed here, coincidentally, um, are the same as um, what Peebles uh, and um, a colleague of his uh, found in the number of phenomena that they uh, found providing visible energy changes. I think what is happening with um, dark matter and dark energy is that those energies are not translated into what's called Gibbs free energy. That is energy that can lead to explosions or other visible effects. Uh, and so the list that uh, Peebles had uh, accumulated around the year 2004 was almost identical to what I'd done in, in the list just on morphology, morphological grounds back 20 years earlier. So they're sort of independently checking each other. Um, but um, none of that, none of the things that they were showing, you know, explosive uh, effects of all kinds, evolutionary effects, were being affected by either dark matter or dark energy. So those energies just sort of seem to be sitting there as blobs uh, which don't are not don't have any corresponding free energy to show changes that are occurring they're just going to be sitting there and so far at least we haven't found any particular phenomena that um, we can say oh yeah this is due to um, dark matter or dark energy except their gravitational effects. And in the case of the dark matter, the distribution of mass in the form of dark matter, which seems to give gravitational lensing. Thank you very much. I, I thanks again, Professor Arvid. And uh...